Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the pilot episode of Navigating Netflix, the show designed to prioritize your mind for movies that feed your mind. My name is James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com, and I'm joined today by Richard Grove and Lisa Arbacheski of PeaceRevolution.org and Paul Verge of DivergentFilms.com. And our first film and our first episode is appropriately titled the experiment as this is our first episode of a new show coming from the tragedy and hope.com community featuring a group called navigating Netflix, where we will get into films on Netflix that perhaps are diamonds in the rough or films you've never seen before, or even in the case of today, a film that is being prominently displayed on the front page of Netflix, but something that has a bit more behind the scenes, and I think that's what we want to try and get into and to flesh it out and give the subtext to folks. Hey there, Travis. Travis, you've been talking about seeing the world. You're firing me. Not firing. Laying off. I need to get paid. Get innovative then, man. Don't tell me you don't know how to do that. I'm going to India. Maybe you should go. Be a pretty penny, which I don't got. Did not go over a liquor store. Michael Barris. Travis. What we will be doing here, for those of you that don't know, will be a behavioral experiment. We will be simulating the conditions of life inside a state penitentiary. We are strangers in a strange land, brother. Some of you will have no civil rights. If any of you want to leave, now is your last chance. You lock up any animal long enough and the strong's gonna eat the weak. Later, pal. Nobody's leaving here until their plates are clean. You heard the man. You gotta eat it. Hey, step back! This is your fault! That is for inciting them. We gotta keep the order. Respond commensurately. I'm going to suggest that we play by the rules. Is that understood? Yes, sir. We have to scare them. Look, I just don't want that light to come on because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. 77. He's a ringleader. Do we have the proper respect for authority now? You are a prisoner. That is exactly what you are. When you speak, can you hear yourself? Whatever fire you got in your belly, let's let it go. What is wrong with you guys? Mr. Scavos. So I'm going to hand this off to Richard Grove of TragedyAndHope.com. Hey, thanks, James. That was an excellent introduction, and uh, I thank you for taking the time and putting in the effort, taking a good idea, which was the group where we're sharing these links. And you know, if you watch a movie that's empowering, you give a little paragraph about why it's empowering or what you got out of it and how it pertains to reality. And then you took it a step further and you started talking about it on your podcast, Media Monarchy. And then once I heard that a couple of times, I was like, yeah, you know, we really should, you know, what's keeping us from doing that? It's a good idea. Why isn't it going anywhere? And so finally it came down to the, the stellar decision to set a date and actually say, we're going to do it instead of just hypothesizing, like we'd like to do it in the future and we're going to do it in the future. We just haven't set a date yet. And uh, I think that's all it took really to get that little step forward to get it started was, you know, to, uh, to put it in our schedule and to set some time aside to prepare and to watch and take notes and then to uh, constructively share it with other people who might be interested in getting a little bit more out of you know the, the Hollywood stream of consciousness. So as we mentioned, our, our first film is called The Experiment, and it's a 2010 dramatization that was released actually straight to, straight to video, as, as we still say, although it's for the most part straight to internet streaming and, and on demand. But this is, of course, based on the real-life 1971 Stanford prison experiment 
that we'll right out of the gate mention was funded by the U.S. Office of Naval Research and was headed by psychology professor Philip Zimbardo of Stanford University. So the film is, like I said, from 2010 and stars Adrian Brody and Forrest Whitaker. And Paul, why don't you get into a bit of the film and, and what what we're dealing with here? Well, uh, the experiment, it's, it's actually based on both the the actual experiment itself with Zimbardo that was conducted in 71, and then uh, also a, a German film called Das Experiment, which is based on the same uh, experiment. And uh, this, this film was made in 2010 and uh, essentially is a, a kind of gritty dramatization of certain key events from that experiment, from the Stanford Prison Experiment, but, you know, dressed up for, uh, for the, the film audience, I guess. And it's... Uh, you know, there's some pretty disturbing uh, events that go on in the film, but it, it does a really good job of portraying exactly how these characters, where some are given authority and some are relegated to this prison status, how they fit into those roles and how they go along with, uh, you know, fitting in, I guess, to these assigned roles. And so it's an interesting study of, of the nature of authority, um, how different personality types take to that authority and both use and abuse it. And, uh, and how people in the prisoner roles, uh, some of them both go along to get along, but others rebel and, and want to uh, stand up for their rights, even though they've been told, like, your civil rights will be taken away. And um, the one, you know, different factor between the real experiment and the, the film is that in the film, money, a, a large sum of money is the motivating factor for a lot of the characters, whereas in real life, the uh, all of the... the Prisoners and guards were all students at the university um, who were, you know, had, had been selected from a pool of like 75 people. So it was a little bit more of a prepared and controlled environment, um, and it was, wasn't was racially mixed in, in the original experiment, whereas in the film they, they mix it up a bit to try and uh, make it more reflective of, I guess, what the audience would, would be. But um, it's really interesting to notice the the aspects of the real experiment that they did keep in terms of like the length the experiment went on it was supposed to be a, a two week experiment but it lasted only six days um, elements of the torture that they, that they used and physical uh, abuse and, and deprivation uh, so that they could still stay within the framework of these rules that were imposed upon them by the, the controlling scientists so it was yeah it was a effective film in, in portraying and it is, as you said, it is a, a fairly graphic film. You know, it's it's pretty. I think, as Netflix says, it's it's scary, it's violent, it's dark, and it's gritty, and reminds me in a way of. And, and there are explicit and implicit references to some other films. Clockwork Orange is kind of implied in some of the experimentation that goes on towards the beginning of the film, and. I also see references to Lord of the Flies within there as well, as far as this community figuring out who's in control and who is in charge. And there's also overt and explicit references to films like Full Metal Jacket, also by Stanley Kubrick. And they also reference the film Red Dawn in talking about one of the characters said their dad made them watch Red Dawn all of the time because they said the, the communists were, were going to take over. So I find it interesting that they reference by name Full Metal Jacket, which for folks that haven't seen that film, Stanley Kubrick's 1987 film where Vincent D'Onofrio ultimately loses it in boot camp and assassinates his drill sergeant and then commits suicide. And then the film shifts into sort of a part two. But uh, Rich, you and Lisa, I want to hear your breakdown and, and connections of this film. So, yeah, when I... When I first watched the experiment, the the reason that I recommended it was that uh, I started watching some movie that I didn't even know what it was or what it was about. And then a couple minutes into the movie, I was like, this sounds a lot like the Stanford Prison Experiment. And then I started watching more. I was like, dude, this is the Stanford Prison Experiment. They made a multi-hundred million dollar movie or whatever the budget was to present this idea to people. And I think that although the Milgram Experiment and the, the Stanford Prison Experiment uh, have ethical questions and questions about the scientific method and not having an independent validator involved and all these other things that could have been done protocol-wise, ethics-wise, moral-wise. 
uh, the, the fact that in the experiments, Milgram and Zimbardo both are creating a microcosm of what this world actually is. It's people wearing costumes, asserting their authority over you, and you've been trained and entrained and conditioned into a system that teaches you to capitulate to these stimulus with, you know, stimuli with responses. And between that stimulus and that response, there is a room, there is space. And in that space is where we make our choices, and it's those choices where we start thinking between the stimulus and response that we're actually able to escape these systems created and, uh, you know, uh, so astutely observed in compressed form by Milgram and uh, Zimbardo. Uh, it's just two of many psychological experiments of that time trying to break down the human being into machine parts so that they could be controlled by a few people. What I found interesting was today when we were watching the clip of Zimbardo and the actual students, the college students who participated in the Stanford prison experiment, the guards and the prisoners, what I was reminded of is John Taylor Gatto's work and his, uh, specifically the, the, the seven things that he's, that they, that they teach all the students. Well, and, but specifically provisional self-esteem and outsourcing your thinking or capitulating constantly to authority figures. Because what they do is they put you in this irrational environment wherein the first thing they do is strip you of your identity. And he called it the degradation process, which is breaking them down and stripping them, humiliating them, stripping them of their self-esteem, etc. So... I was thinking, you know, these college students all probably went through the public education system. It'd be interesting to know whether or not they did and whether or not they had that 15,000 hours of programming that put them in the frame of mind wherein their identity could be usurped, could be undermined by these authority figures. And of course, you know, it's, it's easier to talk about than to actually be in the situation. But I was reminded again and again of Gatto's work and how this conditioning system of compul- compulsory schooling or outcomes-based schooling is really affecting people's sovereignty of mind and sovereignty of judgment and the ability to have a moral and a value compass. Well, and the fact that it's all being, it's all being run under irrationality, and then as part of that irrationality, they attack the primary rule, the, the rule of identity. And once your identity is gone and you're, now you're just a number – and now that you've been humiliated because you think other people can say mean things to you and hurt your feelings because you don't yet have self-responsibility over your feelings and understanding that that person doesn't know you. So therefore, nothing they're saying has to be accurate. And you're the one that knows you and other people know you, but these people don't. So it should be practically impossible for them to humiliate you or to talk in a derogatory way where it gets your emotional reaction, where it then transfers physiologically through your amygdala and send, you know, the fear fight or the, the fear complex and in your fight and flight responses to that start to take place. And now you've cut off all problem solving, you know, capabilities because you're angry or you're fearful and that stops the neocortex from doing its job. And right there, when they get you to act like an animal because they're taking away your identity, they're taking away your ability to reason and deal with the situation because they're being irrational. They're, they've broken the laws of cause and effect. They can do anything they want there. They are your controllers. They have these uniforms and these costumes and these badges and these billy clubs and these sunglasses. And because they got picked over here and you're picked over here, now that's a defined difference. And that is a direct microcosm of what we have in the real world. Whether it's people putting costumes on and going to the other side of the world to kill people or pe- people putting costumes on and going around their neighborhood to, to shoot or to you know do other things to people and take away their liberties and freedoms. Because I argue that you cannot defend a law that you can't define. And if you say that your, your authority over me derives from the government, well, well, let's go one step further. Where does government get its authority? From the sovereign people. The people who espouse the, that they can be represented by a government because all governments have to be by consent. Otherwise, they're not government. It's a dictatorship or tyranny. And the film, I now I believe it's our, our, our sort of main character, the character Forrest Whitaker plays, who I believe most resembles in the actual experiment the, the lead guard, the one who sort of took the lead to become the most sadistic is referred to in the original experiment as John Wayne. And you have uh, another film reference there, just as that main guard, I believe, was only reacting to one of the prisoners. 
acting as though he was Paul Newman in Cool Hand Luke. And that entire film is basically based on, you know, the strong willed prisoner versus the sadistic, you know, guard or prison warden. But Forrest Whitaker, I believe, says at least twice in the film, try to be rational. And he says that to who was basically his nemesis. And they came in as friends, but the Adrian Brody character, Travis. So I, that is interesting that they say at least, you know, at least twice. I made the note of that. Try and be rational. But, Rich, mm-hmm. you also said you, you discovered that, you know, you were watching this film before realizing exactly what it was and then going, oh, wow, they're really kind of putting this back out to the masses. There are reports of yet another version of this that's currently in production to possibly be released this year in 2011 to be called explicitly the Stanford Prison Experiment. And from the looks of it, the cast and the crew and the production that it's even actually a larger production that will probably be released in theaters. So the idea that this kind of scheme and this kind of experiment is being put back out into the masses, I think struck me as I was screening it yesterday. Are they trying to place the idea of sooner or later, the structures that you kind of rely on as being in control and being your daddy might not be there. So whether that's your local police or your cops who are either you know, being funded or defunded and all their, you know, taken away the power that ultimately it's going to be us taking care of each other. That definitely struck me as, as something being put out in, you know, into the world, into pop culture that, hey, you guys may be on your own. So you better figure out if you're a prisoner or a guard, because, you know, if, if everything perhaps may collapse in, in America, you guys are going to be on your own. Okay. Well, I was going to say along those lines, it raised the question in my mind, what is the purpose or the practical application of identifying personality traits or character flaws of individuals who will or are likely to abuse power in order to keep it? So, in other words, what is the practical application of the experiment in the first place? Right. I mean, because when they identify the guards, for example, it's like they're trying to identify certain personality traits or characteristics, et cetera, who of people who will most likely abuse the power. That's true. So what is the practical application for that in the map in the macrocosm is that, you know, how they choose TSA agents or other people who are now tasked with violating our rights they have on a regular basis, it's all costume-based authority. Well, because so, or someone else has given them the authority, given them the authority, sure. and it's vested in them through the vest that they wear, with its you know shiny piece of ornate metal and the fact that they have several weapons strapped to their side, right? And I don't know. With Forrest Whitaker's character, he's like a textbook uh, potential abuser of power because his character. Is has been bullied. Is in this situation where he's like living with his mother, and uh, and she calls him chicken shit, and he's he feels like he's trapped, like he has no control over his life. So once he gets into a position of authority, and he observes that these guys are willing to take this amount of control, just when someone dictates something, they'll do start doing the push-ups. He, you can see it in his eyes. He's he's putting together these things in his head, and that's when that's when he decides to assert himself. And then once he gets a taste of that power, he he actually gets turned on by the feeling of being able to control other people because it's something that he's been lacking. His character has been lacking. Uh, well, no, not only that, but I, I, you know, you could you could look at it from if you wanted to uh, like defining the microcosm as being there's this fake prison, and we're arbitrarily or not so arbitrarily going to define some people as guards, some people as prisoners. And then we're going to have this, uh, this communication system where we're watching over you. And if this red light turns on, it means you've acted poorly, right? And so these guys keep ex- escalating their activities, waiting for the red light to go on. And they accidentally go across, way across the line, but the light doesn't come on. And then they realize there's no law, that there's nobody watching that's going to stop the experiment, that the rules don't matter, all these things, right? So that's the, mi- the, that's the microcosm. If you relate it directly to the macrocosm, it then becomes... Religion and state 
and they're going to provide you with people and costumes to watch over you. And don't worry, there are checks and balances. And don't worry, if you guys really get out of line and break these Ten Commandments, there's this guy called God who's watching over you all the time like the big brother of nature, and he's going to step in and, and do this and that. And that's part of uh, Forrest Whitaker's conditioning because it shows him continuously reading the same book. It's not He's not looking around the world. He's reading the same book all the time. He's reading the Bible. And yeah. once he has that, that like... Uh, subverted mentality where he's already outsourced his critical thinking to some other establishment, whether it's a state or religion or whatever, it's, it's refreshing for him probably when he gets behind there and gets a little power. And what does he do instead of like trying to make those two weeks, Hey, we're all getting paid here. Let's just chill out. And we're all going to, you know, keep our minds about reality. He took it as my solidarity and get through it together. Instead, it's all about divide and conquer. Right. He's like, no, I'm going to abuse my power. He's like the John Wayne character. He's the one that says, yeah, I'm going to be the worst. I'm going to play a play a role because the guy in the actual experiment that did the most, you know, in my opinion, ferocious actions, uh, he says that he was playing a role. And that since he believed he was supposed to be a prison guard, he figured he'd be like that guy and Cool Hand Luke, like you guys observed before. So that whole mentality of being able to see something on Hollywood, you know, the, the, the big screen production of this idea of the experiment and juxtapose it to something you can see for free on Google Video with Philip Zimbardo and his own footage that he taped inside Stanford Prison Building 420, the psychology department – which is an ironic place for them to do it, but we can leave that alone for now. But the, the point is that you can juxtapose these two things, and now all of a sudden this random movie that I caught, The Experiment, which I thought, wow, this is you know, kind of over the top, and then I was like, wow, this is, this is you know, evoking some history, and it's in making those connections to reality that now this kind of arbitrary movie that could have just been an entertaining action movie now becomes meaningful, leads you to a lesson where you can better understand what's going on in this world, and to define that... You know, people don't necessarily have these irrational tendencies. I mean, you do have irrationality until you discipline your mind and in, into being able to focus and think and, and use logic. But that irrationality, instead of them taking us and saying, hey, let's teach logic and we can all get along, they're like, no, let's use that fire of irrationality to control other people from fear, anger, frustration, confusion. And so that's really, I think, from my perspective, why I thought the movie was meaningful is because it helps you make that microcosm macrocosm connection and it's a direct proportion of what's really going on here well i was i was going to touch on what you had asked of what sort of what's the what's the practical application of doing something like this one on the sort of simpler level it almost reminds me of the way they would sort of and probably still do i guess cast reality shows those kind of reality shows where let's say put everybody in a house or let's put everybody on an island or something What's the scientific formulation of people that we can put together that we know are going to explode and and cause all kinds of problems because that makes for interesting, fun TV? The same way of what are these sort of personalities that we can identify and we'll make sure this person's a guard and we'll make sure this person's a prisoner that will be, you know, sort of guaranteed to, you know, to create results. But on the larger level, it would seem... And and we I don't think have mentioned it explicitly yet, but the connections to something like the Abu Ghraib prison scandal, something like this would it would almost give that sort of plausible denial of saying, oh well, you know, we yeah we set up this big experiment, but we had no way of knowing that he was going to go crazy and want to do all that stuff. So we you know we're unconnected, and it was a few bad apples, as they like to say during Abu Ghraib. So what you were just talking about. About how they, you know, ob- whether it's Abu Ghraib or they experiment the movie or the Stanford Prison experiment or especially the Milgram experiment, what they're using is what they learned out of World War II. And if I might reference a book called World as Laboratory Experiments with Mice, Mazes, and Men by Rebecca Lemov, it says on page 226 the most striking thing about Eichmann for a supposed criminal mastermind was his dullness. He spoke only bureaucraties. The German word, Amtssprache, was one he used himself. And so it, he, was inca- he was incapable of uttering a sentence that was not cliché. And so the idea is that it was the nature of the words that they were using 
the bureaucrat language, which does not give you choice. It gives you orders. It says you're an employee. You're compartmentalized. You do not have responsibility over your actions. You are outsourcing your mind and you are under someone else's realm of control. And this is exactly how they did the Milgram experiment where guys are like, I'm not going to shock him again because that's going to kill him. The guy in the white jacket, who's the authority, says, don't worry, I'll be responsible for it. And that's a fallacy right there to think that somebody else is going to be responsible for your actions. Well, you know, so that right there. So the idea of Amtsprache is the, the verbal language that's used by the people who are the eugenicists, who are the racists, who are the globalists, all these same people that, you know, initiated apartheid and concentration camps well back in the 1800s in Africa, well, you know, before the Germans ever got to it. So the Germans didn't come up with Amtsprache, this way of using words to control people to commit genocide and murder. They just kind of perfected it and they gave it a German word and then it was popularized through Eichmann, but it didn't originate with him. And so you can hear people like Marshall Rosenberg use the word Amtsprache. You'll see Scott Noble use it in his films, uh, Psy War and Human Resources, both of which reference this book. I don't know if that's on TV. <laughs> and uh, it's an excellent resource because what you see is whether it's the, the, you know, the experiment or world is laboratory, what they're telling you is that you know, this is a microcosm. You should learn from it because this is exactly what they're trying to develop in the world overall is a global Internet media network that's run by the corporations that has no international borders that can control millions and millions and millions and millions of minds per channel. And so the idea is that if you had to deal with people man to man, person to person to – you know, put down the the dissenters and the revolution, then that takes a lot of resources. And if you're going to be a gangster, you got to have a lot of resources, a lot of military, all these other things. But in today's you know world, we're mostly not controlled by the military industrial complex. That's the threat used against us. We're controlled day to day by the media complex and the education complex. Because you know, when you're in school, you're not watching a lot of media. You're in school all day, right? You're watching you know ads and stuff like that, cartoons when you get home. But for everyone else, they are subservient every day to what their corporations think is going on, to what the newspapers are saying, to what all these different corporate, you know, commercialized sellout types of news organizations that just give you entertainment and tell you about things that you don't need to know about to survive. It's 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 funny because the, the film is is in a sense the social experiment, right, to show how uh, different people from different walks of life you know, they're shown in interviews and what they're willing to conceal and what biases and what things they've gone through and what that brings in terms of those personality types to the experiment and how, you know, in modern science, in psychology, they've actually, you know, whittled hum- human behavior down to these certain archetypes. And like James was saying, in reality shows, they'll, they'll hire people to pl- fill in the archetype and then pit these types of of archetypes against each other because they know it'll create some kind of conflict. And, um, yeah, you have to question, you know, other than, you know, how quickly will people capitulate to the roles that they're handed? There's a a more, I don't know if it's a cynical aspect of the experiment where it's like how quickly or how guaranteed is it that these people who, you know, are somewhat, you know, bringing some baggage or are somewhat damaged as individuals and you're, you're handing them authority. You're handing them the ability to govern over others. And so when we have broken, broken people governing over us, then of course it's going to lead to a broken situation. And that's kind of, that's on a macrocosmic scale. That's what we have right in, in our whole social system is, is the, the, the sociopaths and a lot of psychopaths, not only being promoted and rising to those high positions, but actually actively seeking them out because they know that they can uh, take advantage of people who are willing to just go along, you know? And we, we see that, you know, in the real world of the, the very folks who put themselves in positions of, oh, well, I want to save the children. Mark Foley ends up getting busted for improper sexual relations and flirt, you know, with, with underage kids. The, they want to get into the position to where 
they can do their evil deeds under the guise of, no, I'm, I'm helping, I'm here for the kids, or I'm against drugs, or I'm against these things, and they inevitably seem to get busted for doing that precise thing. I'm a priest, right? It's like, <laughs> uh-huh. if you're a pedophile, why not go to the Vatican, wherein you can be, you know, be who you want to be, and you know that at the very top, it's not only condoned, you know, it's it's not only condoned, but it's covered up. Well, Ratzinger's guy just got caught a couple weeks ago for being involved in that. There was the other priest who got caught ordering, uh, you know, a couple boys on the phone, and he said preferably mentally disturbed. And you can guess why, you know, that would be good, because it's good to cover up your tracks. You know, the kid's mentally disturbed. So and there was an Ed Norton movie about it years ago that showed that whole situation. But instead of actually breaking out what's going on, it made it, you know, they, there was another twist in the movie. Uh, what was that called? Primal Fear. Fear. Yeah, Primal Fear. And then there's the recent document published by the Vatican that blames all of the pedophilia on the hippies. Yes, well, on the hippies. Clearly yes. never existed before the 60s, the pedophilia. Like, so, <laughs> yeah, to, as if just it just started to happen in the 60s, and conveniently we can blame it on those long hairs, because as if we never had long hairs before in society. So this, I, you know, the, the liberal long hairs are the ones who would be advocating for, you know, teaching about being gay and being a pedophile, and it's all it's all the same, right? In, in the simplified world of kind of illusion, I guess. But again, it's, it's those, those same people who, who seek authority, who seek to be in authoritative positions, you always have to question their motives and intentions because there's presuppositions about the fact that they would seek out that position means that they know, they think they know best. They think they know their, their judgment is more reasonable and logical than your judgment and that you should defer to what they say or think as, as, uh, them representing you and thus, you know, having authority over you. And it's just surprising how many people go along with that who are like, well, it's easier if somebody else makes the decision with me or this decision for me. So even though I don't really agree with them, you know, they've made a decision. So I, I, I'll give them that and I'll just go along with it. And that protects the status quo and allows people in those positions of authority to continue to abuse those positions. So the positions remain, you know, People get caught and they get fined or put in jail or they don't get caught, but more people come in to fill those positions and continue the cycle of abuse until people stop trusting those positions of authority. Well, and it goes to show that once a a small group of people unite to do something against everyone else's free will, that the people who are being disempowered have a lot of trouble getting their act together. They act out individually. They get punished individually. But it's their unwillingness to assert their own integrity of what they know the truth and facts to be, which is this is just an experiment. You're not really a prison guard. I'm not really a prisoner. There's no need to try to kill anybody. There's no need for all these other things to go on. And if we all maintain this perspective, which is reality, by the way, then we'll be fine. But as soon as we let the fear creep in, as soon as we stop thinking for ourselves, as soon as we stop processing the contents that come in through our five senses, and as soon as we start listening to illusions and innuendo and all sorts of arbitrary things, reason and logic and rationality leave the room, you're left with irrationality, you're left with chaos, you're left with people at their worst. They're, they're without their thinking It's worse than animals because we are equipped to do things like torture that animals don't really do. Like a bear might eat you alive, but it's not like trying to do it because it's got a grudge against you because of something else. It's That's just how it rolls, right? And so what you have to realize is that a a certain percentage of the population out there, maybe one in every 50 people, is either a sociopath or a psychopath. And that's not a usually, you know, thrown out term. There's a checklist and you can specify going through the checklist to see if somebody you know or someone you work with might fall into that. And it's not so much about taking action against them as protecting yourself from their actions, right? You don't want to find out that you're hanging out with a psychopath at the last minute. That's not a good scenario. What you want to do is observe, have situational awareness, use your five senses, think. And if somebody's acting without ideas of cause and effect of their actions to other people, and they go through all these other check check boxes, which are you know legitimate. It's how everyone else make you know it's an, a a common objective rating whether or not it's accurate or right or wrong. But it's what's out there. 
And so in order to see what's going on and to see these people who are willing to abuse their power, who might get into political positions or in high positions in a church and help to cover up, like you might have one guy who's helping to reinitiate reinitiate and reignite the idea of the Inquisition, and then that guy might become Pope. And that guy might have already helped to cover up the pedophilia in the first place, and that's how he got to be Pope, right? So whether it's Papa Razzi or any of these other characters out there, it's all part of the experiment, and that's why it's relevant, because there are people among us who do not feel empathy, and unless you realize that your empathy and your compassion make you vulnerable to people who do not feel those things, you're not really walking around as a grown-up. That's still a child's perspective that... This world just has checks and balances and they're like invisible people keeping an eye on us and they'll step in and, and make things. No, you're left with cause and effect. And right now we got criminals all over the place and irrationality everywhere. And it's because it's been taken out of our education system. So nobody has an anchor, uh, something to, to, you know, help them stay in, re, you know, objective reality. And, it, and, you know, so that, that causes a lot of chaos, which is reflected in the microcosm that is the experiment. I guess I'd like to think that if I were placed in this, in that position, and I guess, you know, there are re- some of the characters within the film, some of the smaller characters do kind of point out, hey, guys, you know, chill out. <laughs> but again, this film is predicated on a, a pretty sizable cash payoff that you'd get $1,000 for every day you do it, and ultimately if it all goes to completion, you, that every individual person would get $14,000. That there's, you know, I'd like to think if I were in there that, you know, there would be a more vocal, rational supporter of, hey, guys, 14 grand. Like, all we have to do is just chill out and clean our plates and we'll be good to go. But, of course, that wouldn't make for an exciting film. I believe we do have a clip that we want to check out of the actual Stanford prison experiment because an angle I don't believe we've mentioned yet is Philip Zimbardo. As the overseer of this original experiment is by no means an impartial observer and has been shown to have gotten carried away with even his role. Am am I right? Not only are you accurate on that point, but I would note that the first place I encountered Philip Zimbardo in this world was as either a guest on The Daily Show or The Colbert Report. And the ironic thing was... uh, I have also seen him in an RSA animation video on uh, time, the relativeness of time and perspective and stuff like that, right? So my first encounter in this world with Philip Zimbardo was, here's this nice old man telling us these nice things on TV, right? And so then when I, when I you know, and I learned about the prison, uh, Stanford's prison experiment, but I didn't, I never attached a face to the guy. I never saw the video. I just read about it. I was like, oh, that's fucked up. And I moved on, right? Then, then you make this connection. So I see him on the Daily Show or Colbert Report, Comedy, Comedy Central, whatever the point being. And then I caught wind of uh, Stanford Prison Experiment again in video form a couple years ago. And I was like, wait a minute. This is the guy that they showed me on the show that I like and that I trust. And they told me he's a nice guy. And here he is doing all these like crazy things that have, have been used as precedent in rationalization for irrational acts all over the place, right, by politics, military, religion, etc., so, uh, juxtaposed, you know, I, I, to those two things, I learned not to trust Comedy Central with uh, purveying me with truthful information. And when you look into the writers of those shows, you see that they're attached to clubs and groups like Council on Foreign Relations and other, you know, groups like Brookings Institution, etc. And then I would note that people do not join groups unless their personalities are aligned with those groups, right? It's not just, you know, I'm going to join that group. It's a serious thing. So, after learning the Zimbardo lesson, which is don't trust what you see on TV, even if it's presented to you in a funny way and it resonates with you, you still have to think critically about it because they may be getting paid to present you with a, like a favorable, favorable perspective of the guy who's running the prison, right? They're teaching us to love our servitude and to you know, love the people who are keeping us uh, mentally and physically enslaved and to worship them. So we're supposed to fear them. We're, we're supposed to like not not like them, you know. Uh, they're not they're not trying to be popular, but they do want us to love them. They're like, we want to rule over you, but we also want your respect. But we're not going to do it in a logical or reasonable or rational way. But we're going to demand and coerce your respect anyway because we don't care if it's genuine. They just want our worship, right? 
And so it gets out of hand. And that's the whole mentality behind the prison guards, behind Zimbardo running the experiment and refusing to shut it off until an outside observer comes in. But we can, uh, I'm going to roll that clip. And then uh, after we watch it, we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. And we'll have some questions that I'm sure can be answered between the th- four of us. I was the first one to be picked up, so they put me in a cell. They locked me in there in this degrading little outfit. so loud in my life. Never been so upset in my life. It was an experience of being out of control. Stanford University, Northern California. One of America's most prestigious academic institutions. And in 1971, the scene of one of the most notorious experiments in the history of psychology. I was interested in what happens if you put good people in an evil place. Does the situation outside of you, the institution, come to control your behavior? Or does the things inside of you, your attitude, your values, your morality, uh, allow you to to rise above uh, a negative environment? The negative environment Zimbardo chose to test his ideas was a prison he would convert the basement of the university's psychology department into a subterranean jail. We would put uh, prison doors on each of three office cells. In the cells, there was nothing but three beds, uh, and, and there was very, actually very little room for anything else because they were very small. And here we had solitary confinement, which we call the hole. Uh, and in the hole was, was the place where prisons would be put for punishment. It was a very, very small area. When you closed the door, it was totally dark. All the guards wore military uniforms, and we had them wear these silver reflecting sunglasses. And what it does is you can't see someone's eyes, and so that loses some of the the humanness, the humanity. In general, we wanted to create a sense of power. That is, the guards, as a category, are people who have power over others. In this case, power over the prisoners. A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Can you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. Teacher. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. Experiment, that's all, get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please, go right on. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock, 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. I'm not going to kill that man in there. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. 
Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Like Milgram, Zimbardo was interested in the power of social situations to overwhelm individuals. His experiment would test people's responses to an oppressive regime. Would they accept it or act against it? Zimbardo's experiment was conducted against a backdrop of civil rights activism and protest against the Vietnam War. There was a sense of student power, student dominance, and student rebellion against, against authority in general. It was from the student body that Zimbardo selected his participants. After passing tests to screen out anyone with a psychological abnormality, they were paid $15 a day. Each was randomly assigned to the role of guard or prisoner. It was a prison to me. It still is a prison to me. I don't look on it as an experiment or a simulation. It was just a, a, a prison that was run by psychologists instead of run by the state. I was 20, and that September I was going to college, and it would be nice to have a summer job, but there sure wasn't a lot of time left. And I looked in the want ads, and I found this thing which was just going to fit. It was just two weeks. Once you put a uniform on and are given a job to keep these people in line, you really become that person. Once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick. I was on summer break from my first year in college and uh, I was looking for a job. Had to choose between that and making pizzas. That sounded like a lot more fun. As well as running the experiment, Zimbardo took on the role of prison superintendent. He began by briefing the guards. I said, you have to maintain law and order. If prisoners escape, the study is over, and you can't use physical violence. You can't create a sense of fear in them. You can't create a notion that their life is totally controlled by us, and that there'll be constant surveillance. We have total power in the situation, and they have none. Prisoners were brought to the basement prison, blindfolded, to confuse them about their whereabouts. They were stripped and deloused. Of course, the guards started making fun of their genitals and humiliating them. And really, it's the start of what's known as the degradation process, which not only prisons, but lots of military-type outfits use that process. When I first got here, even though like, I had to strip, when they would call me names, I still didn't feel at all like I was in the prison. I was just looking at it as a job. I recall sort of walking up and down the uh, very short hallway, which was the prison hall, and looking in on the prisoners, and they're basically lounging around on their beds. I felt it was like the day in summer camp. The first day, I said, this might be a very long, very boring experiment, uh, because it's conceivable nothing will happen. I arrived independently at the conclusion that this experiment must have been put together to prove a point about prisons being a cruel and inhumane place. And therefore, I would do my part you know, to, to help those results come about. I was a confrontational and arrogant 18-year-old uh, at the time. And uh, you know, I said, somebody ought to stir things up a bit here. On the second morning, the prisoners had decided to stir things up as well. The guards found some of them had used their beds to barricade their cell. Prisoner 8612 was one of the ringleaders of the rebellion. Initially, I was stunned. I didn't expect a rebellion because not much happened. I mean, it wasn't clear what they were what they were rebelling against, but they were rebelling against the status, rebelling against being anonymous, against um, having to follow orders from, from these, these other students. As punishment for the rebellion, prisoner 8612 was put in the hole, and the guards turned on the other prisoners. The guards felt that they now have to up the ante of being tough. The prisoners made the mistake of beginning to use profanity against the guards in a very personalized way. So not against the guards, but, you know, you little punk, you, you big shit, and so forth. And the guards got furious. Everybody out! All right, come on! Up, up! Well, gentlemen, 
gentlemen, here it is, time for count. Prisoners were repeatedly woken in the middle of the night. The guards made them do menial, physical tasks and clean out toilets with their bare hands. We made it a, a point to not give them any sense of, of comfort or what to expect, that, it, you know, that anything could happen to them at any time, including being rousted from their sleep at any hour and forced to stand up in a line and have me hurl insults at them and uh, make them do exercises. When you interrupt people's sleep, they tend to become a little disoriented. And since there was no daylight in the prison, they had no idea whether it was night or day. I think that I was the instigator of this uh, whole schedule of harassment. The harassment of the guards took its toll on rebellion leader 8612. He told Zimbardo he wanted to leave the experiment. Zimbardo responded not as a psychologist, but as a prison superintendent. I said, well, I can see to it the guards don't hassle you personally. Uh, and in return, all I would like is some information from time to time about what the prisoners are doing. So essentially I'm saying, I'd like you to be a snitch, an informer. And I said, think it over, and if you still want to leave, fine. Confused, prisoner 8612 returned to his cell and told the other prisoners that no one could leave. <laughs> he believed that we wouldn't let him go, although we've never said that. But the fact that he was the ringleader of the rebellion and he told the other prisoners they won't let you leave, and that really transformed the experiment into a prison. I was told that I couldn't quit. And at that point, I just felt totally hopeless. More hopeless than I'd ever felt before. Soon after returning to his cell, prisoner 8612 started showing signs of severe distress. God damn it! You're fucked up! You don't know, you don't know! I mean, God! I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? I just fucking can't take it. He came up with a plan that if he acted crazy, we would have to release him. You're so fucked up inside. I feel really fucked up inside. You don't know. I gotta go. I can to a doctor, anything. I can't say that. I'm fucked up. I don't know how to explain it. I'm all fucked up inside. Help it out! Help it out now! It starts with make believe, and then he's doing it and cursing and screaming and you know whatever that little boundary is that he 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 moved across. Not that he became really crazy, but. Uh, he became, you know, excessively disturbed. I mean, so much so that we immediately said, we have to release him. As an experience, it, it was unique. I've never screamed so loud in my life. Um, I've never been so upset in my life. And it was an experience of being out of control. The boundary between reality and make-believe was to become blurred even for Zimbardo. A rumor circulated that released prisoner 8612 would return with friends to liberate the remaining prisoners. I quickly convinced myself that, you know, my most important function was, you know, not to allow this prison liberation to occur. And what could I do to keep my prison going, not the experiment going? The prison was dismantled and the prisoners moved to another part of the building. Zimbardo waited in the empty corridor, preparing to tell 8612 and his friends that the study was over, when a colleague appeared and began asking questions about the scientific basis of the research. I'm trying to get rid of him. Then he says, what's the independent variable? I get furious because he doesn't understand <laughs> that there's a riot about to take place, that this prison is about to erupt. I had totally lost this whole other identity of scientists, researchers, psychologists. The rumored jailbreak never materialized. The guards had dismantled the prison for nothing and had to rebuild it. They took their frustration out on the prisoners. They escalated again the level of control, the level of dominance, the level of humiliating behavior. Eight one nine was the next prisoner to rebel against the harassment of the guards. He barricaded himself in his cell and refused to take part in the count. You're not only not getting a cigarette, but for as long as the cell is blockaded, you're going to be in solitary when you get out. For 819's disobedience, the guards made his cellmates do mindless work. 
This undermined any vestige of solidarity amongst the prisoners, who now chose to accept the tyranny of the guards rather than risk further harassment. That was one of the surprising things to me is that there was so little uh, that the prisoners did to support one another after we started our campaign of, you know, divide and conquer. Isolated and distraught, prisoner 819 told Zimbardo he wanted to leave. While I'm interviewing 819 uh, and saying, okay, you know, it's all over, thank you for your participation, you know, I'll give you money for the whole, for the whole two weeks, uh, even though you're leaving early, he hears the prisoners shouting, 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. And he said, I can't leave. And he's crying. And he says, I can't leave. I said, what do you mean you can't leave? He said, no, I have to go back. Because I don't want them to think you know, that I'm a bad prisoner. And that's, that's when I really flipped out. That in such a, such a short time, you know, a college student's thinking could become so distorted. I said, you're not a bad prisoner, you're not a prisoner, and this is not a prison. And it was this thing where he opened his eyes, and it was just really like a cloud being lifted. So, I don't know about you guys, but even, you know, even though I know about the topic, and I've looked at it before, it's still shocking to watch that 10 minutes to see how out of control and out of hand college students at one of the most respected universities in this country, after 48 hours, have completely lost their identity due to the controlling of their environment. And that this line of thinking starts with someone like Luther Burbank and his tests on, on plants and their stimuli response uh, characteristics to things like light. And then Pavlov carries this forward in stimulus response in animals. And then people like Skinner take it to people and stimulus response in people. And without that thinking, without that process in between the stimulus and response, we can be very easily manipulated, controlled, lose our identity, lose all sense of reality, become very irrational break all of our own self-truths and our the laws we live by like you know uh forrest whitaker's character is a, is a you know a mother loving christian where he's living with his mom taking care of his mom taking all this flack from his situation and immediately in another situation where they control the environment well he doesn't need jesus now he has authority and power he doesn't need these other things that he would been, he had been using as crutches right so just coming full circle that they can do this to a human being. These these weren't people off the street. These weren't homeless people. These were college students at Stanford University, a university where most people can't you know get the grades to get in there. Right? It's a, it's kind of an elite school. It has things like the Stanford Research Institute and the SRI projects, which work very close glove in hand with government intelligence, government military industrial complex, all these sorts of things. So again, coming back to the motivations of Zimbardo and when if you're a, you know a PhD carrying out experiments why don't you know about you know having an independent verifier there someone who can not play two roles in the same experiment i mean that just seemed like it was set up to set a precedent for irrational action to be justified because we can't help it as human beings that's just how we are well and what we didn't see in the clip was how the experiment actually ended at Stanford University because Zim, Zimbardo had clearly lost touch with reality, and he says he lost touch with his identity. And it took, I, I believe she was a PhD or a graduate student there, or maybe she was a... Uh, well, it was his girlfriend, which they didn't mention in the, in the movie, and also that the people had escaped and gone to the police, which they don't mention in that BBC version of Zimbardo's experiment, which is in the Google links, notes for this episode. I'm actually reading here on Google that she was a UC Berkeley, I'm sorry, a UC Berkeley psychologist. And she, she went in to observe the experiment. And here Zimbardo is, you know, hey, Chris, watch this. And she sees these college kids linked together by their ankles, you know, bags over their heads, being marched down this hall and the most horrific of scenes and she's immediately sick to her stomach she has to turn away she begins to sob and she essentially says to him uh in the clip that you guys were just watching she says to him young boys are suffering and you are responsible for making this happen and you have to end this immediately and so he ends it the next day um there's an article that I linked to in the Navigating Netflix group where 
it's from 1997. It's, it's on Stanford's website. And uh, let's see, she says she's speaking at a symposium of the American Psychological Association. And she says, uh, do not consider me a hero because, A, I walked into the experiment late. And therefore, I was more likely to be startled than those who had been planning it for months and observing it for five days. And second, that she was involved in a romantic relationship with Zimbardo, the experiment's, the experiment's principal investigator, and not working for him or under him as a graduate student or a colleague. And so she was in a different, she was in a different, uh, he, was in a, he was not an authority over her, in other words. And she had not yet been indoctrinated into his little cult in the basement right. of Building 420. Right. Stanford University. Well, and the, the other aspect is, how much does it cost to go to Stanford? I don't know how much it was back in 1971, but I assume it was more than most colleges that you know everyone else is going to. So what you have in the Hollywood version of the experiment, the movie, right, based on you know this uh, nebulous thing that they don't really tell you about. They're not like saying, go look up the Stanford prison experiment at the end of that movie. They're like, it's done here, roll credits, thanks for your money, I hope you bought some food, that's what Hollywood's all about. But when you think about what if the Hollywood movie had actually been Zimbardo's experiment? What if the movie showed college students who were at an elite school who were being arrested by these other pseudo characters and costumes and their rights being violated? Their parents would have been outraged, right? But the Hollywood version shows you, oh, these are just guys who are out of work and they need money, so who cares what really happens to them, right? They're the lower class people. And so the way Hollywood pre you know, presents it to you as part of their predictive programming is here's this one situation, which is based on a true situation, but the true situation is not good enough to tell you about. So we're going to make up this fictional situation so you'll feel all the right ways about this thing, right? Because I think when you look at either the Milgram experiment, and when you watch these videos of these experiments, Milgram or uh, you know Zimbardo's work in the Stanford Prison Experiment, you really start to see it's a sociological study. It's an anthropological study of, of humanity and our interactions and what kind of situations we put in each other in for what types of reasons. And when you're putting someone there and you're asking them to shock somebody else or you're asking them to act to as an authority, right, to go against their conscience and to do things that they know are wrong, but they're only doing them because of the Amtsprache, because of the office speech that doesn't really give you choice, and you're in a chain of command, and you're in a chain of authority, and you have outsourced your consciousness, and someone else is in control of your actions, and therefore you are no longer responsible anymore for some reason, right? That's all irrational, broken cause and effect, anti-reality right there. And when people are indoctrinated through education not to recognize these things, it makes us all susceptible to falling under the prey of those predators who learn to control the mind better than we know how to control our own. I think for me, what I was immediately struck by in the BBC clip that we just saw is how young the guys were, which, of course, in our Hollywood version there of mixed race and mixed age and, and a bit older. But as you were talking about in the Hollywood film, Rich, at the end, yeah, the, the sun is coming up, the bus is there to pick them up. It is, in a way, a sort of happy ending that it's sort of, oh, everything's everything's OK and the bus is here and we'll all ride home. And, hey, we you know, we've we've got our checks and everything's taken care of. You hear briefly in the 2010 film, The Experiment, at the very end, as our guys are being let out, it's kind of intercut with some news media that you hear where you hear reference to the administrator of this experiment being prosecuted for manslaughter, where within the film, one of our characters are, is killed, is murdered. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something we'll probably have to put at the top of the show. This is, of course, yeah, replete with spoilers for the film. But I don't think that takes away from the experience and the, the learning experience, I think, of, of the films and of what we're trying to do here on Navigating Netflix. So, yes, spoiler alerts all, all throughout. They make a reference you hear on the news within the film that, you know, the administrator is being tried for, for manslaughter, being prosecuted for manslaughter. And that this experiment is traced back to a secretive think tank with connections to the government. And if you're not paying attention, you may even miss it. It, it. it fires by really quickly in just the last 60 seconds of the film, I believe. Yeah, I think it's interesting at the end that they, they do reveal that it's a, a corporate think tank 
uh, you know, with connections to the government because it it shows this motivation of who would have an interest in knowing that kind of information, who who would utilize the results of that experiment for practical application for themselves. And the government has an interest in populating these positions of authority with certain personality types. And they might not be looking for people who are incorruptible, but people who will go along with whatever that their own authority tells them and will run their own thing the way that they feel, as long as it's respecting the person above them. I know up here, the Canadian government that we have right now, the Harper government, has only in the last like five years passed new strict ordinance within the intergovernmental affairs itself that you suddenly have to get a much higher approval. Like the approval process now has to go up higher up the chain of command. And there's, so they're essentially further centralizing the authority uh, more and more so that no one can deviate from the party line and so that all communications that are intergovernmental that are going to the outside world for public consumption are very, very managed. And uh, so in that sense, you, I, you know, I'm not sure if in the real Stanford prison experiment, if Zombardo, uh, you know, tried to plead some, some kind of rationalization for the, for the experiment to continue and, and his girlfriend, you know, like threatened to break off the relationship if he didn't quit or what the actual specific exchange was. But I'm sure there was some aspect of his own ego or of his own enjoyment of being in that position of authority that wanted to to continue the experiment for his own selfish means. And that's kind of the personality type, you know, whether you want to call it megalomaniacal or whatever, that seems to want to be the, the capstone type person in a corporate pyramid. And I just thought it's interesting that in terms of corporatism, the, the, the corporations, these straw men are essentially vehicles through which people can, can still do the actions of a human being, but, but without the emotions, without the, uh, awareness of consequences of their actions as an authority. And so, in a sense, that's what all of these, you know, guards and all of these people in these positions are acting in a very corporate, you know, regimented manner and, uh, serving their, their higher good. Even if it's not for profit, it's for the, the continuation of power is a sense of profit, I guess, for someone who's in power. So, that's my take. And yeah, from, doing research before how about how about i start like this because i wanted to talk about what you had read to me from the wikipedia page or whatever research you were doing about how uh prisoners escaped so students escaped from the basement and they were having a problem and so i think in the film or at least in the film of zimbardo on google that that little documentary they refer to forced for the students quit but I think what he's referring to is, as a function of their escaping, he said the experiment will terminate for them, right? So after these four escaped, I think that's the four that's actually in, in history. Because what I'm, what I'm indicating is the BBC production of Zimbardo's experiment that's on Google is not necessarily accurate even to the facts of what happened. It's kind of a softer view on what happened. Because from my understanding, several students escaped and Zimbardo went back to the police who had arrested the, them in the first place to start the process of eroding their identity. So it's a, it's a shock and awe. You're getting arrested by police. You're taken in. You're blindfolded. You're, you're strip searched. All this different stuff that happens at the beginning of the experiment. And in real life, uh, from my recollection, Zimbardo goes to that same authority again. He goes to the police and he says, look, I had these students escape. It's getting out of hand. We need to use your jail and it's at that point where the police are like, we can't have anything else to do with it. We thought you guys are cool, you're Stanford University, but it sounds like something's going wrong, and we can't be liable for that, so you're on your own. It was the, the Palo Alto police that, on the, morning, on the morning that the students were to be arrested, the Palo Alto police assisted them in the mock arresting of these students, etc., and it, it was, I think it was on the wiki page, I can't find it exactly right now, but... Um, let's see. We'll link it in the show notes. But it is interesting that even as another set of authority figures, that the the Palo Alto police would would actually say, ah, you know what, we don't want anything to do with this. That they actually maybe acted correctly by saying we don't want to be associated with this thing that seems to already be getting away from you guys. I was just going to say I found the the quote on the Wikipedia page. It says that, uh, let's see. 
On the fourth day, some prisoners were talking about trying to escape. Zimbardo and the guards attempted to move the prisoners to a more secure local police station, but officials there said they could no longer participate in Zimbardo's experiment. That's what I read. So they didn't want to let them use the facility to expand the scope of the experiment, I guess. They didn't have enough room to isolate those guys, like in the film. Yeah, and that's the other thing. The film takes place in the middle of nowhere, as opposed to the the middle, like the basement of a building that your parents are paying umpteen thousand dollars a year for you to go to and all this other stuff. So, right? So if you're unemployed and you're showing up for some experiment, you're an adult. You, you, you've you seen some things in your world, so you might be, you know, naive, but you might also be, you know, understanding you might have to go through some shit to, you know, to get through this job, right? Whereas a student participating in that experiment, just trying to earn a little extra money, is, a, you know, by definition, a student, not out in the real world dealing and, and, you know, surviving on their own yet. They're training to do that. So I think Zimbardo doing it on students is is part of the issue because couldn't he have just as, you know, likely had done it with the adults as they show in the the Hollywood version of the experiment and gotten a similar result because, you know, in other words, is it the fallacy of the selected sample or is it a fallacy of a neglected aspect that he's not incorporating into, you know, what he's trying to do? Or was he just asked to do that and it was like a menu item on a thing he fills out for the Department of Defense, right? And they're like, oh, go ahead and do this. And even though there'll be some flack, you won't lose your job. You can still work at Stanford. Well, and even calling it an experiment is very interesting to me because I hadn't really considered it until I heard Clay Ramsey. He was prisoner 8612, who was 20 at the time. And he said it wasn't an experiment. It was a prison run by psychologists. He was. This, it was the same quote, the, the one that you heard in the clip saying, uh, he said, an experience of being out of control. But, he, you know, he, he was like... But his his perspective after participating was that it was not an experiment. It was a prison run by psychologists. Well, and let's let's say a word. What did you guys think about that character that had obviously been through prison before, knew what the game was, and was just going along with it so he didn't have to suffer the brunt of it? Because he knew he wasn't in control. And the rest of these people were like, no, we're still human beings, right? Cause, well, you're going back to the film now. Right, the Hollywood version. Mm-hmm. Juxtaposing yeah. that to reality. That character had clearly been broken by the system before and, uh, you know, knew the easiest way to go along to get along in that kind of system where everything is regimented. And so for him, he's just like a two week stretch for 14 grand is, is no big deal. But, uh, you know, Adrian Brody's, I guess, curiosity, spoiler alert, gets the, gets the best of him and he <laughs> has to make it, uh, an issue, I guess. But, uh, you know, I just thought that it was certain aspects of believability. You, like, I'm sure they, they, these events kind of mirror uh, a lot of the events that happened in the real experiment. But, you know, they're not being, in, at least in the film, which I'm not sure if it's based in reality, but the guy getting deprived of his, uh, you know, diabetic medicine. Insulin, yeah. It's... You you would wonder if the people who were watching, who were clearly watching, uh, how they would let it get to that point where somebody gets killed, like because they don't. I don't remember there being a scene where they expressly sign a waiver, in indemnifying these guys from harm and all this stuff, right? So, I guess that's the reason the you know Brody's character speaks out at the end is because they let it go overboard. I just found it interesting that you never hear from the scientists or any of the, the characters that set up the control scheme at the beginning. You don't hear from them or get their perspective or their defense or explanation of what the experiment was for. It's more like, oh, we paid you, so just shut up. <laughs> the character you, you mentioned, Rich, that, w- that we discover in the film has actually done actual prison time before. As, you know, as they give you little subtle hints, he's very tattooed, his his facial hair looks kind of prisony when he's eating in the cafeteria. You can tell he has that guarded, you know, I have to guard my food because he's, he's really been inside. But he says to Adrian Brody, I will not let you interfere with my ability to earn a paycheck. And that he knows that this is, this is just a, a job in a sense, but he's already been a broken person and who knows how to play the game to go along to get along. 
So it's interesting. I, I guess I anticipated out of that character m- more more bad stuff that I was, oh, God, he's the guy who's been in prison before, so he's going to be the one who's going to really stir things up. But in, in reality, he's he's kind of the opposite. He he goes along to get along. Yeah, he. what Lisa was saying is he had already lo- lost his rights before. He's already used to the game. You, and then you juxtapose that to one of the prison guards in the Hollywood film, The Experiment, one of those prison guards who starts to empathize with the prisoners. And they're like, well, you're not a guard. You must be a prisoner, Right. And even though they didn't necessarily, in the real experiment, deny someone of their insulin, and that's kind of a Hollywood theatrical dramatization used as a plot point in somebody's script, in real life, whether it's uh, you know in that situation or the real-life prison guard system that exists in this massive prison industrial complex, what you have is those guards are not being hired for their rationality. They're not being hired for certain characteristics that would prevent them in a, in a place where there's no other authority from getting out of hand. So what you have is a bunch of people who have the potential to, to abuse authority, and they especially have the potential to abuse it when they know that there's no cause and effect feedback. No one's going to do anything. The red light never comes on in the movie. And in real life, the warden's never really, you know, the, the warden, who is Zimbardo in the actual experiment, and, uh, you know, uh, Fisher, what's his name, Fisher Stevens? Mm. <laughs> from that movie Hackers and... Uh, I, short circuit. Johnny Robot, what's it? Johnny Five? Yeah, short circuit. <laughs> short circuit. <laughs> shot, shot in Oregon. <laughs> See? You have to love movies to do this show, right? We got to know a lot. So, Just anyway, like Fisher Stevens, uh, you know, is playing the bad guy. And what you have is whether it's Fisher Stevens in the movie or Philip Zimbardo in the actual experiment, they're playing the prison warden. And in real life, the prison wardens aren't going to the newspapers and saying, hey, there's crazy stuff going on here. Can you guys come in and help us? They're just doing it. Nothing leaves there. They run it in a totalitarian, non-constitutional republic democracy type way. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a monarchy or a, uh, how how would you say when one, zone. Yeah, well, one person's ruling in an authoritative chain over everybody else, and it's not like there's a bunch of guards that's making decisions based on the experience, you know, in the, the you know the prison itself. You have a, you have some guy in the office who's remote from it a lot of times and is dealing through you know intermediaries in a bureaucratic system to manage the you know the system. So when you look at the like the bare bones of how they run prisons in general, it's not a whole lot different than how government is really run, except. Prisons don't have hundreds of billions of dollars to spend on propaganda or have a you know 15,000-hour indoctrination system to condition you to think that it's not a prison, right? When you see a prison, it's just a prison. But if you go through all these other processes, you could be in a prison and not really recognize it because they've dressed up the whole place to look like it's freedom. Because you can buy you know one of any 18,000 toothbrushes that are out there. So spend all day making a decision on that because you're free. Free to buy what you want. Well, they've got these mini kind of monarchy models, right? Where it's essentially one person at the top dictates to a few who are willing to capitulate to even an irrational authority, and then they f- inflict that irrational in- authority on the masses on an individualized basis. And in that regard, everyone else who's seeing the individuals being harassed or tortured or whatever, they then just form their uh, behaviors to conform to whatever rule set is proposed so that they don't get singled out, right? And that's what the real fear is, is the fear of being singled out. And in the film, once they all realize that, that how far the guards are willing to push, then they say, okay, well, we can't let ourselves be singled out again. And they finally, you know, free each other and assemble to, uh, to, to win back their freedom. <laughs> well, and what would happen if the, if the people who were, chosen as the prisoners what if those people knew how to manage their emotions how to deal with their fear how to communicate in such a way that you're always reminding the other person that we're two human beings you're not an authority and i'm not a slave right and it's it's through you know maintaining your empathetic connection through keeping your emotions in check by remaining rational when other people want to get all irrational to use your intellect when they want to rely on their emotion and fear to scare you. Because at the end of the day, what does the guard have if you're not scared of him anymore? This is the lesson in Guy Ritchie's movie, Revolver, right? 
Not mm-hmm. to have a spoiler alert on that. That's an excellent film for anyone to check out if you're into, you know, a thinking thinking person's action movie, right? But the the idea is that you've got this situation where we're all controlled by fear, and the macrocosm of the experiment would be Revolver, because what they're showing you in there is that the whole world is being run through fear and using gold and these other things to get people to do and what, divide and conquer, right? Because where in the film. Uh, the Hollywood feature film, they finally did get together and escape. Uh, in the clip, I don't know if, if it was in the, the clip we just played or if it's if it's further along, but Dave says that, and he's the he was the prison guard who was uh, kind of... John lead, Wayne. Right, John Wayne. Uh, he says there was little that the prisoners did to help each other, and that after he and the other guards started their campaign of divide and conquer, all of the solidarity between the prisoners diminished entirely. And it was all about self-preservation, even at the expense of the other prisoners. But they can't really do the divide and conquer effectively until they first break down your identity and your sense of reality and your sense of time and things like that. Because, he's, you know, in either case, you're not given daylight, you're not given... You know, these other things uh, to let you know they're being disrupted in their sleep all night. I mean, when you look at Abu Ghraib and you look at the conditions in the experiment or the Stanford prison experiment, either the reality or the Hollywood fiction, there's a lot of Abu Ghraib type of psychological warfare being conducted. And I would, you know, observe that it's not just limited to inside of prisons, right? They roll that psychological warfare, the same psychological types of uh, strategies through corporate media, through Hollywood films. Well, what is the lesson? Is the lesson that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and so radiate the power, share the power, <laughs> and, one, and learn to communicate. Like, yeah, there's so many situations in the film and probably in the real life experiment where if people were communicating in an effective manner, then all sorts of problems would be avoided. Um, but you know, people uh, people tend to abuse their power, which causes a reaction in the people without the power, which then the people in power used to justify continuing the abuse of their authority and so it becomes a cyclical thing and and you practicing constructive behaviors for yourself like self-government self-ownership and knowing how to communicate in a peaceful way that's still rational and and still defends your own rights is going to be the essential factor for defending yourself against someone who does want to impose authority until they get to that violent point right and so being aware of how you're communicating you know, you're not trying to agitate the person who's in the perceived position of authority because then they're just going to use that to justify imposing their authority on you. So you have to kind of disarm them first in, uh, with your words and then try, and then you can show them some reason and rationality because, as James pointed out, Forrest Whitaker's character, he, he talks about rationality first, but when he is clearly being irrational and Adrian Brody's character says, you call this being rational? His response is to hold up his billy club like he's going to hit him and that's that's the emotion saying screw rationality i'm going straight to violence because you you've clearly bested me in the argument so my only response left is violence and that's a very telling point i think that's almost like where the the line is crossed in the film where he, they're like you know even though you're not allowed violence they're like screw that the threat of violence is sometimes worse than violence itself so well i think that you know it, it's been demonstrated that the fear of violence is physiologically worse than the violence itself because when they've shocked people it's the the waiting and the expect expecting of the shock that's showing more trauma than the shock itself the shock then almost becomes a relief because then they know they have a couple more seconds before the unknown arrives of when they're going to get shocked again right and what you're observing is it's when the use of violence comes into play, that is one side saying, I'm completely intellectually bankrupt. I can use no logic or reason to justify my actions, but I'm going to take my actions anyway. And that's what should have brought unification to everybody else in that prison, including the other guards. Because once somebody loses their rights, everybody loses their rights. And if you lose your rights, you have no private property, and there is no history beyond that. It's all tyranny. So that's why it's important that you can't sign away your rights. You maintain these rights as as long as you breathe air. And so even if you sign a contract with a company, no, you didn't have full disclosure. You can't enforce that in court. You cannot sign away the rights that people are born with. And so without individual rights, there are no group rights. There is no 
half freedom, half slavery. Socialism, collectivism, communism, they're all the same thing. They all mean that you sacrifice yourself, your personal property, the rights of your own thoughts, your words, and your work to the state, and you don't get anything useful in exchange, and you wouldn't make that change voluntarily, so they're going to attempt to use force and trickery to get people to give up individual liberty, to be liberally minded, meaning a, a free mind, having nothing to do with either of those so-called political parties, understanding that the only thing going on out there are individuals trying to see what's going on in this world and to survive and thrive, and you have people who are parts of groups who seek to be collectivists and take away the rest of our rights. That single point right there is what should be able to unify people who not only watch that movie, but almost, you know, I'm going to just wage a bet here, you know, hypothetically, and say every Hollywood film that we review is going to be based on irrationality. And if logic and reason were on the scene, it would be over in about 10 minutes. There'd be no two-hour story of here's all the crazy shit that happened because somebody wasn't thinking logically, whether it's The Hangover or any of these other films that are super popular. I mean, it's yeah, it's entertaining, but it is amusement, which means you're not thinking as opposed to musing, which is thinking. So when you're being amused, it's good. You know, This is one of the things navigating Netflix is designed to do. You're no longer just going to be amused. You'll also get educated, which means to draw out your potential. That's part of uh, educare. To lead yourself in your own autonomous, you know, free thinking direction. And that'll keep you out of the experiment, whether it's in a microcosm or a macrocosm. I hope it just showed in the video, Rich, as you just explained and broke down the word amusement, that it blew my mind. And I hope that experience for folks, I think, translates in this show that there is something there to learn in the very, you know, language that we use in our you know, supposedly simple Hollywood, you know, kind of entertainment. But ho- hopefully, yeah, I think that that right there kind of summed up this whole first kind of ex- experiment for me. Right on. Well, that's what it's all about. <laughs> so uh, you want to close it down and mention uh, the various websites that uh, we participate in? Yes. So my name's James Evan Pilato. I'm the host and webmaster of MediaMonarchy.com, and I also do a video series with... James Corbett of Corbett Report uh, that we call NewWorldNextWeek.com. And so glad to begin to share NavigatingNetflix.com with, with everyone out there. So, Paul, if you'd like to, to wrap up on your end. Yeah, well, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us on this episode of Nav- Navigating Netflix. And, uh, you know, enjoy. hope you enjoy the experiment, even though it's... Uh, it's got some graphic moments, but it's still a powerful film with a strong message. But, uh, yeah, my websites are divergentfilms.com, hijackinghumanity.com. Uh, Remedy Radio is the new podcast you can catch that uh, has featured both James and Richard, among many others. And um, yeah, Tragedy and Hope, you know, great central location for people to check out all our work and the Navigating Netflix group. So I think you said it all. We'll see you next time on Navigating Netflix. Peace.